Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We've heard that passage, that, that verse, every single time we've been in this passage. Hope, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, the, the patriarchs, the people from Abraham on, God had made promises to Abram about Abram, who became Abraham, whose son was Isaac, whose son, one of sons is Jacob. They, they, were, they were believing God for other people, us, actually. We are the recipients of what they had hoped for, for people to come before them. So there's something about faith that isn't about self, but it's about others. It's about that which will come later. So they were looking forward to what they hoped for and certain of what God had promised, but they're not going to see for themselves. Now, the author of the book of Hebrews, uh, this is after Jesus, and we know that our hope is, our hope is Jesus, and we, he, it's not that we can't see him, we, 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 we can't, but we do have a good picture of him in the scripture. And, but he did walk the earth and talk and love and know people. So it's not something, it's a little bit different, but the, these, he, these, these people, recipients of the book of Hebrews were Jewish people who did not yet know that the Messiah had already come, that their hope had been fulfilled, that all nations of the earth will be blessed through them. So he goes through, this author goes through and he sh shows them all the different ways that the patriarchs of the faith had been faithful. He's trying to make a case for Christ through the people that they lift up. And one of the beautiful things I think about scripture, and I think it's actually is a, a, a testament to the fact that the scripture is reliable. In fact, it's the only scripture that I know of, the only of, of any world religion or world holy book that actually does something different than everybody else. It, it allows the characters in the scripture to be flawed. They don't make Paul out to be some wonderful man. Paul was a murderer. And they don't make Jacob out to be this saint. Jacob was a difficult, difficult, wonderfully talented and intellectual man, but he is full of flaws. Let's look at it for a second. Jacob, the, for the beginning, before he was even born, something went wrong. Actually, that's not the right way of putting it. There was turmoil in his life before he was actually birthed. There was some wrestling going on in the womb and God kind of said, hey, it's going to get weird. The older will serve the younger. And out of this, these two twins, two nations will be birthed, the Edomites and then what ends up being Israel. And here's when, when Esau, the older one, the older brother of Jacob, um, when they're being born, Esau comes out and Jacob is hanging on to his ankle. I don't know about you, but I don't remember anything in utero. The fact that this guy had a will to like, I'm, you're not getting born before me. He comes out. God had already, in his foreknowledge, in his, even his predestined plan, he knew how this was going to work out. But it, it got weird. It got so weird that, that Jacob would walk around, um, as he grew up, he became, he kind of like stay close to camp, and he was in charge of a lot of the herds, and Esau was a hunter, man, and he, his dad loved him best, because his dad was a hunter, and his dad loved the wild meat, and that kind of stuff, so, but, but Jacob, his, his mom loved him more, and he hung around, hung around the, the, the herds a little bit more, and walked around like this a lot, and one day Esau I don't know if it was a day, it's probably a multiple day hunting trip. He was off. He was hunting and he came back empty handed. And he didn't come back to the camp where mom and dad were. He came back to the camp where, where Jacob was kind of tending the herds and he was kind of in charge of this particular area. And he comes in, he's so hangry, he's famished. He goes, I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. Give me something to eat. And Jacob, I, he had to have been scheming on this for months, waiting for his brother, who's a great hunter, to come back empty handed and he's going to play him. And so he goes, he, give me something to eat. Just give me something to eat. Red stew. Now, our Hungarian friends will be here in a couple of weeks. And I can tell you that I don't understand what red stew is. I'm not a big stew fan, but red stew I'm probably not going to touch. Because in Hungary a couple of, or last year, um, they gave us uh, cold red cherry soup. <laughs> I was raised right, so I ate it. But never again. Never again. I'll, oh, tummy issues. Tummy issues. No, I can't. I, it, I'm not a soup or stew fan, but that's what Jacob had ready. And when, when Esau comes in, he goes, I'm, I'm starving. Give me some of that. Jacob says, all right, you can have some for the small price of your birthright. 
Now, just so you know how birthright works back then, oldest son gets double what everybody else gets. So if you have 12 sons, the inheritance gets divided up into 13 parts, and the first one gets two parts. 12, 13, number one gets two. That's no big deal if there's 12. But if there's two, one gets two-thirds, the other gets a third. So Esau is willing to give up a third of everything he's going to get when his dad dies for some stew. So he ends up saying, well, what is good is my birthright if I'm going to be dead anyway? He sold it out. So Jacob is a schemer. It goes on, and Jacob, Jacob later on, when dad's getting old, he ends up living a lot longer than they thought. But when dad gets old, Jacob is there. And, and uh, he, he, Esau was going to get the blessing that God gave to Abraham and to Isaac. And he was out hunting because his dad said, go, get, go kill me something. Bring it back, make some food, and I'll give you your blessing. Jacob finds out about it, him and his mom, and they, 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 they scheme, and he puts on some, because Esau was really hairy, they put on some stuff, uh, um, skins, and makes himself smell all gamey. And he goes in, he lies to his dad, and he gets the very blessing that Esau was supposed to receive. And that is that your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Can't be retracted once it's been given. And so mom finds out that Esau is so angry that he's going to, he said, once my dad's dead and I'm going to, and I finish grieving him, I'm going to murder my brother. So his brother runs away. His brother runs away. Jacob runs away. He's going to go find some family somewhere else. And this is where the passage that we're reading today comes in. He's running away. It says, Jacob left Beersheba, which is where they were living, and set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night. Because the sun was set, or the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Sounds comfy. My pillow, my pillow, my pillow. Um, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth and its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord your God, the father of, uh, the, I'm the Lord the God of your father, Abraham, and God of Isaac. I will give to you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust on the earth, and you will spread out west to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I will be with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. What did Jacob do to deserve that kind of blessing from God? Absolutely nothing. From the day he was born, he was trying to get what belonged to his brother. He schemed with his brother to get his birthright, and he schemed with his mother against his brother to get his blessing. And now, he, fearing for his life, he's running away. And God meets him there, and it's no longer the God of Abraham, no longer the God of, of Isaac. It is now God himself speaks to the ankle grabber, one who deceives, scheming person, Jacob, and says, through you, all of us will be blessed. And he picks up, and he goes off to find the family that his mom has sent him to find, and he falls in love with Rachel, just beautiful woman that he just, oh, and he tells the, her dad that I will, I, will, I will work for you for seven years for no pay if the pay at the end is Rachel. And he worked for seven years and it went great until he, on that wedding day and he pulled over the veil and it's Leah. Not the one he was in love with. Not the most beautiful of the women. What have you done? Well, it's our, it's our custom. You don't marry off your younger one before your older one. So you got the older one. Finish up the wedding week, work another seven years. I'll give you the one you want. 14 years. Now, the guy got bamboozled, but in the midst of that, he was conniving. He was smart. His animal husbandry skills were amazing, and his flocks got strong. His flocks, you know, things went well. And he realized that his in-laws are starting to say, hey, why is everything going well for him when things aren't going so well for us? And so, when, so he, Jacob does what Jacob does. He grabbed his wives and his children the grandchildren of his father-in-law, and takes off without telling anybody. Father-in-law and all of his other sons, his sons and his army, and they come to, they're going to get him. And God stops him and says, no, 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 leave him alone. So they have this little cookout, little covenant. I won't go past here. You don't go past here. No harm will come to either of us. Jacob's going back home because God had said, I will give you the land that you're lying on. So he's on his way back. 
When he's on his way back, he hears that his brother Esau, who has become a fighting nation, a warrior, Esau's coming, he's going to take him out because he had vowed that he's going to murder his brother once his dad is dead. And so Jacob does what wise Christian followers of the Yahweh do. He schemed. He divided up his family, herds, wives, children, sent half of them up ahead and said, if, if you run into Esau, you tell him, we're all good. If it's good with you, it's good with me. But Jacob knew if they kill them, I can take the rest of us, including me, and run away. And that night, after he divided up his people and his stuff, he crossed the fort of the Jabbok and he had a little time with God alone. And God didn't show up in a dream with a staircase from heaven to earth or angels descending and ascending. God showed up in human form and he wrestled with Jacob all night long. And I don't know about you, if you've ever wrestled, I'm 52 years old and shaped like a pear. Wrestling now would last about 30 seconds. When, when Cam was growing up, he was little. Dads, you've seen this. You, your kid, want your boy, if you have a son, he wants to arm wrestle and you, you arm wrestle and you go, oh, that's so hard. And he, you know, you whack. I'm not, really nicely. Just, you know. But as they grow older, you're like, ah, okay. And then there comes that day when you're like, I'm not sure I'm going to win this one. So you just outwill him and you put him down, right? But then you say something like, well, look, I've been beating you your whole life. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to hurt you, how you're feeling about yourself because you know you're going to lose next time, right? But if you've ever wrestled with a four-year-old, no problem. If you ever wrestled with a 12-year-old, okay. You wrestle with a 20-year-old? Imagine wrestling with God all night long. He's wiped out. And God says, and I don't know why the sun coming up means that God has to leave. I don't understand that. But he says, the sun is up. Let me go. Jacob says, I will not let you go till you bless me. <laughs> and what does God say? He asks him one question. What's your name? God knows his name. In order for Jacob to get the blessing that God wants to give him, that he's demanding of God, he has to say, I'm a deceiver. I'm an ankle grabber. I'm a sinner. What has Jacob done to deserve the blessing that God has promised him? Nothing. What has Jacob done to deserve the family that he has and to deserve not being taken down by his brother? Nothing. After, in an audacious fashion, wrestling with God and demanding something from the God of the universe... What does he deserve? Nothing. But God brought him to a point after a lifetime of scheming, strategizing, being an entrepreneur, being a hands-in-the-pocket farmer and animal husbandry, shepherd. God said, who are you really? And when Jacob admitted who he was, God changed his name. And his character. He said, you will no longer be called Jacob. You will now be called Israel. Because you have struggled with man and with God. And other than the dislocated hip, <laughs> you've not been overcome. That's the moment that the nation of Israel was birthed. But I don't want you to miss why it was birthed. Jacob had to say... I can't do it. If you're a Jacob, and I very much am, if you have a mind that can understand most concepts, if you can run down the roads in your mind and, 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 and plan for contingencies, if most of the time, now, yeah, you've been betrayed or you've been bamboozled or you've, been, you, you've missed a few things, but overall, if you've got it figured out, God asks you one question. Who are you? Really? My mom, when I would talk back to her when I was a kid, she used to say, who do you think you are? Grab me by the ear. I brought you into the... No, she wouldn't have said something like that. 
My dad would have. But she reminded me that I came from someone, that I'm not as big a deal as I think I am. And God reminds every one of us that we're not as big a deal as we think we are. So if you think you have a leg up on other people, if you think, you, yeah, you know what? God has touched you in a different way than everybody else. Praise God. But understand that if anyone's ever called you gifted, it means that someone has given you something you didn't develop for yourself. To be gifted means that someone gifted you something, and that's God. You cannot outthink God, outstrategize God. You can't out, out, outmaneuver God. You can't outthink God. You can't outimpress God. You can't outintellect God. You can't outphilosophize God. You can't outdo God. Jacob could not outdo God. And what, what did God do? God made him a promise. He continued to scheme. He encountered him. He wrestled him until he was exhausted, till he came to the end of himself. And he said, Who are you really? So God is the one who, who initiated the interaction. He's the one that in, initiated the, the, the relationship. 14 to 20 years later, Jacob takes up his side of that relationship. Where are you in that journey? Last week, if you have that, that quiet, steadfast faithfulness, praise God. But if you're itchy, if you're restless, if you've got a brain that you can't turn off, if you're, if you're someone who just, you can't sit still because you have to keep doing, you're Jacob. And God has given you that mind. He's given you that intellect. He's given you that strategy. He's given you those instincts. And he wants to do something with them. And if you're continuing to try to outmaneuver God, I just want you to know that one day you're going to realize that there is indeed a God and you're not it. He has initiated faith with you. He has initiated his story in your life. He has said that I will bless you. And he wants you to simply say, I need you, God. Who do you think you are? It's not the question God asks. God asks you the question, who are you really? And then he asks another Whose are you? Do you belong to yourself or do you belong to God? Now, I doubt very seriously that you're ever going to be crossing the ford of the Jabbok at a place near Peniel and have God show up in bodily form and wrestle with you until you're exhausted and you have that last ounce of energy and you say, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. But many of us do that every day single day with God. I don't want to do it your way. Have you ever been in an argument with guys, in particular guys, have you ever been in an argument with your spouse and you know, you know how to end the argument? Yep. I never meant for you to feel that way. I'm sorry that my actions have caused you to feel that way. Really. And I'll do my best to never treat you that way again. I understand why you feel that way. Would you, would you forgive me for being the cause? It's over. It's over. But every now and then, you just kind of go, not this time. Not this, I'm going to argue. I didn't mean to do that. So why am I in trouble for something I didn't mean to do? Three and a half hours later, what do you do? Never meant to be the cause of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> we do that with God. Whether you're male or female, we do it with God. And he just wants you to give up quicker. It's called submission. You know why? He gifted you with your intellect. He gifted you with your strategy. He gifted you with your instincts. He gifted you with your abilities. He gifted you with your resources. He gifted you with your ability to interact with other people. He's given you those gifts. But you know what he wants to gift you with? Faith. He wants to give you the one thing you cannot give yourself. The recognition that you are not your own, but you belong body and soul and life and the death to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He wants you to, he wants to change you from the inside out so that you're no longer Jacob, but you're Israel. One who works for, who contends with, but works for and works with God. 
He wants to give you the gift of faith that you cannot muster up on your own. He's already promised it. He's offered it. And he's waiting for you to come to the end of yourself so that you will say, yes, Lord. I'm going to end with this little illustration. It's a friend of mine years ago, dying of cancer. Just a wisp of a man, someone I knew in seminary. While I was in seminary, excuse me. It had just eaten him from the inside out. I mean, he was just this shit, just a, just a skeleton. How you doing, man? You okay? How's, how are you? Are you okay with God? And he goes, I realize one thing. Everybody's naked before the Lord. I can't hide anything. Wouldn't it be wonderful, folks, if we all recognize that before we were about to meet him in person? That we're all naked before the Lord. All the flaws, all the warts, all the moles, all the scars, all the scheming. We're naked before God, as Jacob was when he said, Who are, tell me your name. Do you have the courage to humble yourself before the Lord? instead of waiting to be humbled by him. I hope so. Because the gift he wants to give you is faith. Let's pray. Almighty God, give us the courage to be faithful earlier. To be thankful for the minds, the strategy, the abilities, the social graces, all the things that you've gifted us with. Help give us the courage and the humility to say thank you, Lord. And Lord, remind us each day that the question you have for us is, who are you really? And let us be people who are honest with you and then say, Lord, but that's not what matters anymore. What matters now is whose I am. I belong body and soul and life and a death to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, for his sake, through his spirit, for God's glory. Amen. So I'm going to tell you, mainly because I want to show you just how much of a Jacob I, I, I hopefully I'm less like a Jacob than I was, but <clears throat> here's the mistake I made, big mistake I made in the first service. I ended up saying that Esau became the father of the Arab nation, which became the, uh, what we know as Islam primarily. I was trying to say two nations, the Edomites, that ended up being enemies to Israel, much like we saw with Isaac and Ishmael. And then I said, I told this story. When I was at the Dome of the Rock, uh, which is where the Temple Mount, which is where Isaac had been offered up as a sacrifice, we're in there in seminary, and uh, me being a Jacob think, hey, let me, and I got this figured out, and I'm going to just make sure everyone knows how smart I am about stuff. I'm in the Dome of the Rock. This is one of the, not the, but one of the most holy places in all of Islam. Okay, I'm in, in the, in, there's an imam walking us around telling us about this rock. And he says, this is where Abraham offered up his son Ishmael. (laughs) I was about to say, that was Isaac. And my friend, Bruce Mulder, took my hand and went, can you imagine the audacity of someone trying to correct someone in their holy place that... I, would have, I might not be here today. <laughs> I was trying to show that God and his choices knows the, the difficult consequences that will come. But he knows what he's doing. And if you join him in what he knows he's doing, there will be difficulty and frustration. There will be heartache and joy. But God's glory will be lifted up. His name will be praised. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed because we say, yes, Lord. So folks, say yes, Lord. And if you think you got everything figured out, realize that God knows better than you do because he, like he certainly knows better than I. And he will put people in your life that will go, no. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine on you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance toward you. That's a look on God's face. God smile at you and give you peace. And all of God's people say, amen. Go with and end the peace of Christ.